Welcome. I think we're going to try and get started. Welcome, everybody. This is our Investing for Good event. Uh, my name is Emily Cotter, and I run the Eco Entrepreneurship Program here at the Brand School. Uh, this event is part of our Women in Innovation and Entrepreneurship speaker series, which was run across campus with our UCSB Innovation and Entrepreneurship Partners. Uh, that includes the Brand School EcoE program, uh, CNSI, CSEP, our Technology Industry Alliance office, as well as our Technology Management program at the College of Engineering. Uh, so we're very excited to put on this wonderful panel. Uh, some of you may know our Eco Entrepreneurship Program focuses on environmental and social ventures. Uh, so obviously we have an interest in impact investing and especially in early stage uh, ventures and funding them. <laughs> We've had a series of uh, successful entrepreneurs, eco-entrepreneurs, come out of our program. We have about 20 in the last seven graduating classes, and 55% of those are women entrepreneurs. Uh, so we serve a very important role in the ecosystem here at UCSB, supporting women entrepreneurs, as well as that focus on social environmental uh, impact. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Julia Z, who is our moderator, and just want to acknowledge and thank her for helping us to recruit all of these amazing ladies that you will hear from today. Uh, this event would not have been possible without her help. So thank you to Julia. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, we are all super pleased to be here. We have an amazing lineup of speakers, as well as a keynote speaker right after this panel. Um, but normally, before I start one of these panels, I really love to see who's in the audience, just so we can get an idea of what your background is and what your interest is, because I think that's always helpful for our speakers when they're addressing questions and thinking about their comments. So um, in the impact investing field, how many of you are sort of new to that? It's a new concept. Why do we care? What are we doing? What are we talking about? Oh, lots of you. Fantastic. Oh, welcome. Welcome to our world. <laughs> Come in and join us. Okay, fantastic. So we have a lot of new people to impact investing. That's very exciting. Okay, how many of you are entrepreneurs or aspirational entrepreneurs? I'm thinking about starting a business. Oh, wonderful, fantastic. Lots of entrepreneurs too. And we have a representative entrepreneur on a panel who's gonna be addressing some of those issues specifically. Um, and then finally, how many of you are UCSB students here? And specifically Bren? Excellent. Okay, very good. Cool. All right, awesome. So that's what we have. We have students, we have entrepreneurs, and then we have riffraff <laughs> of, of some kind here. We don't know why you're here, but we've got riffraff. Okay, fantastic. So, um, so I, I want to start just very quickly, since there are a lot of you who are new to the impact investing field. We, we have actually, it's really interesting, we have um, kind of a cross-section of the field represented here. You're going to hear from there. They do different things in the impact investing field, and you're going to hear a little bit more about them in their comments. But what they have in common, I think, is this idea that they're very, um, they're very focused on the problem that they're trying to solve. And I know all of you here at Brenner are very focused as well on the idea of sustainability and social justice. And, and so they're very focused on the problem. They're very dedicated and passionate about it. And they're very clear on the, the kind of metrics, the impact that they're trying to achieve. And so from, a, from an investment standpoint, I think historically you have a lot of people who have simply said, you know, look, I'm looking for a certain amount of risk return and I want to increase my money so that I can spend it on myself. And um, the impact investing field really evolved out of this idea that um, we would like to align our values with our, with our investment portfolio. And if we could bring some of those tools to bear, like we, we do some charitable work, we do some volunteer work, but we've, if we could use every tool in our toolbox to advance the things that are important to us, wouldn't that be better? So um, I think you're going to hear some of those stories. We'll tease them out. We're going to have Q&A at the end of this, as well as at the end of Kat's um, uh, keynote speech. So I hope you guys have questions. And please feel free to share them, because we're trying to make this useful for you. So, so speak up. Um, so Nancy, I'm going to start with you. You're my first guinea pig today. <laughs> Nancy Swanson, who is based here in Santa Barbara, she leads the Linked Foundation. Um, we actually met years ago when she was the chair of the board of the Elios Foundation, if you have heard of them. Both of them extremely innovative pioneers in the impact investing field, really kind of courageous and catalytic work actually early when there was barely anything to do in the impact investing space. So because we have so many people new to the field, Nancy, I thought perhaps you could take us on a little bit of a 30,000 foot journey in terms of how you guys think about impact investing and then a little bit of an idea about how you've implemented that into the linked foundation portfolio. I'd be happy to. First, I want to say thank you to the Bryn School for having us here. It's a joy 
and we just had lunch and, and met with several of the entrepreneurs, so I'm, I feel very inspired. So thank you for the opportunity to come here. I'm proud to say I've lived in Santa Barbara 26 years. Um, I've been the executive director of the Link Foundation. We're a private foundation. We're based in Carpinteria. And the mission of the foundation is to improve the health and economic self-reliance of women and their families in Latin America and here in the US. We do a lot of our work in Santa Barbara. We do a lot through an alliance that's focused on reproductive health and access because we need to in the US. And most of my work has been spent in Latin America, investing in early stage enterprises that are creating access to healthcare for vulnerable, very poor uh, populations um, in that country. And, the, and just to give it some context, we've, it's a, we're a spin down foundation, so we're at year 12. We'll do another eight to 10 years, so there's been a sense of urgency. If the founder w was here, is, and I work for her directly, we're a really small shop. If you come by, it's myself, and we have an assistant. <laughs> I have a consultant in Seattle, and the idea is, was for us to be nimble, to use our capital, um, to de-risk business models early stage, to think about in, um, supporting models, whether they're nonprofits or for profits around sustainability that can outlive you know, do traditional donor funding and to meet that organization or company where they are with the kind of capital that, that, that they need. So we think about impact. We say, we, we don't report to anybody, but we wanna know that we're really making a difference. So we've been impact oriented. And for us, that means creating access, <coughs> excuse me, to healthcare where there isn't any or where the quality is very, very poor. So how do we improve that and we track it? And we have someone, I do have some, a, a consultant who's fantastic that helps us think about at the foundation level what that impact really means and, and to help portfolio companies and, and organizations to design for that because it's usually an area that requires some level of um, expertise and capability and funding to, to make sure that you know how to measure and think about your impact that's relevant to that organization um, or company. So we do most um, direct investing, so grant, debt, and equity, and, and we think about sustainability in various different ways, and I'm happy to share some of the kind of companies and organizations we're funding and what that means for the, from them on a, the financial side, and then we think about what does that impact mean for that organization. We, do, we invest in funds that are impact-oriented, so uh, we invest in social investment funds, which means we provide capital to an, an organization, and they on lend that capital to social enterprises in the developing world. And we act as a guarantor, which means we lend our uh, balance sheet essentially so that we can, somebody, an organization can then lend to that organization, those dollars are, are, are relatively protected. So we think about impact um, kind of at the front and center of everything that we do, and we think about women um, as the agents of change. So we have th always, thought about women as beneficiaries because we know that when a woman's health improves, her family's health improves, their communities improve, and they become the voices for um, the change in their uh, families. And we're now thinking about gender kind of across the foundation's assets, so which is a new area for us as we spin down. We say, how, to the point, how do we use all the tools in our toolkit? And I'm happy to share kind of some of the tools that we have. But. We're to that. I want to come yeah. back to the total portfolio activation idea that yeah. you guys have implemented. Um, but I'm going to move to Luam. Luam Cafella, who is um, down here from San Francisco. She's one of the investment principals with Village Capital or Vilcap Investments. Um, I don't want to go into like extensive origin story or anything, but yours is so interesting to me because Luam started a career at Carlisle Capital. Carlisle Capital? Carlo Group, which you may or may not have heard of. It's one of the largest private equity real estate investing firms in the world. 200 billion in assets under management, 1,000 investment professionals around the world. And she chose to leave to come to San Francisco and join a small but mighty, small but mighty firm called Village Capital, but you know, like a $20 million fund doing really, really important work at the front lines of early stage social enterprise. And so I was super interested. I thought, I thought our audience might be interested in hearing that evolution and what kind of motivated you to do that sort of work. Yeah, yeah, so I uh, grew up in Kenya and I grew up surrounded by a lot of inequality. So early on in my life, I started thinking about ways to sustainably create more equity. Um, and then I got to college and I started taking finance and economics classes and I thought, okay, investing, that's how we create more equity, we use money to move the needle. Wasn't really sure what moving the needle was exactly, but I just knew money could create some sort of change. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Yeah, so I took my first job um, just knowing that investing was what I wanted to do. So I ended up working at a pretty large private equity firm um, that's global. And it's super large. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, not quite a mom and pop shop. Um, <laughs> But it was a great experience because it taught me a lot, but it forced me to also think about what creating equity really means. And to take a step back and think about what I wanted to do with my life and what sort of impact I wanted to create. Um, and then when I did that, I realized that there was two things that creating equity meant to me. The first is backing overlooked founders, which is female founders and founders of color. And the second is backing founders that are coming up with amazing solutions to major world problems. So looking at my skill set, OK, I'm, I have these uh, investor skills that I could utilize. Not an entrepreneur, maybe one day, but not today. So thinking about how I can use what I have to create this sort of impact was um, one of the decisions that kind of moved me into the early stage impact investing space. So backing these entrepreneurs that don't have access to capital, either because of their race or their gender, they're overlooked, or they work in capital-starved markets, and then backing those uh, founders that are really working on these sustainable solutions that can create the sort of impact that I want to be a part of. So um, both Nancy and Luam are investors. They have assets that they are trying to deploy, and they're trying to do the best job with their investments to do financial returns, as well as the impact they're trying to seek. Nushin is our entrepreneur superstar on the panel today. Nushin Katabi, who's one of the co-founders of Vega Coffee, based here and in Nicaragua? Yeah, Nicaragua and Colombia. And Colombia. Um, also an interesting founder story, which I think we're going to have to share with our audience today, Nushin. So um, tell us how you went from being a lawyer in San Francisco to like an eco-activist entrepreneur warrior. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us about that. Um, OK, well, so yeah, I will try to keep the story short. But essentially, um, really, our origin story started in 2006. My co-founder and husband, Rob, um, he decided to move down to Nicaragua after undergrad and was working in micro lending. One thing led to another and he was connected with a women's run coffee cooperative. And so this coffee cooperative had been growing extremely high quality coffee and it had every certification in the book, fair trade, organic, really uh, the type of coffee we're used to spending $4 or $5 for a cup of black coffee in a coffee shop. But meanwhile, they were earning barely enough to really get by, um, let alone invest in their coffee, invest in growing more coffee, better coffee, and all of that. And so the idea that they came up with together, Rob and this group of really brave, awesome women, was to reserve some of the coffee that they were exporting, roast it themselves, package it, and start selling it locally. Because at that time, Nicaragua was really coming on the map in terms of a tourist destination. So there are hotels and cafes, and now um, they're able to offer a local coffee um, to, to customers versus the usual instant stuff. So that was really kind of the root of Vega. Um, at the same time, I did not know Rob, but I was uh, in Costa Rica teaching English and sort of having somewhat of a parallel experience where I was an avid coffee drinker, probably started drinking coffee way too young. And uh, this was my first time going uh, to coffee farms and meeting the people and places where coffee's grown. And I was totally in love with that whole experience. Rob and I met in law school, and something we shared was that real love of coffee in Central America and all of that. But there was also something kind of darker that we had seen during uh, both of our respective experiences. And it was that despite the fact that, um, again, that these farmers in Costa Rica and Nicaragua were growing this top level coffee um, coveted around the world, they uh, were struggling to send their kids to school. They were struggling to get, um, the roads paved, electricity, water, basic, basic needs met. Um, and meanwhile, having been living in New York City, San Francisco, we were used to paying, you know, astronomicals amount for our coffee. So we were like, what the heck is going on? Um, we started looking into the industry, uh, really trying to learn the ins and outs. And what we realized was that coffee has long been an industry 
that has been really antiquated, full of middlemen, and ultimately the price you pay for coffee, uh, only 5% of that reaches the farmer who's spent years cultivating it. 90% um, of the profits in the supply chain lie with the roaster who spends 15 minutes roasting it and then cuts along the way um, to, to the various uh, middlemen. So we thought, well, what if we could kind of flip that whole thing on its head and bring roasting to origin and uh, train coffee producers in their communities in taking their raw uh, product and making it a fully finished high-end um, artisanal good, package it and market it to the United States, sort of coffee direct from the source, uh, or farmer roasted coffee. And that's essentially sort of how Vega was, was created. Well, and since you're talking about that, I know we have entrepreneurs and aspirational entrepreneurs in the audience. So talk to us a little bit about the journey. It's been about four or mm -hmm. five years since you guys launched Vega officially. Yeah. Did a little bit of a Kickstarter campaign yeah. to get going, friends and family. Yep. I know there's lots to the story, so yep. we yep. probably don't have enough time for the whole story. But a couple, <laughs> yeah, a couple of highlights for entrepreneurs yeah, yeah. in the audience. Absolutely. What have you learned? What do they need to know? Yeah. What can you share? Well, and then, you know, to your point earlier about being attorneys, we <laughs> essentially <laughs> took the plunge um, in 2014. So we, um, we yeah, uh, Rob and our, our really good friend, we had been kind of mulling over, well, what if we could take that initial idea Rob had and really um, scale it internationally? And, and I think like a lot of ventures started, basically was like a dare between the three of us. Okay, who's gonna leave their job and make this happen? And then we just did it. Next thing we know, one of us gave notice, then okay, I gotta give my notice. And so we were, we were really excited to finally make this sort of dream and kind of like, who knows, will this work? Will this fail miserably? Let's, we gotta give it a go or we'll regret it. So we did that, um, moved to Nicaragua, um, and yeah, we launched a Kickstarter about six months in. Um, again, I think that was actually a way for us to be like, okay, there's no going back now. You know, now we're telling other people now we're, what we're trying to do. Yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, we raised um, double our amount. We had put set out for 40k, and then we um, went to SoCap. Um, the Social Capital Markets Conference in San Francisco, the real sort of mecca of all things social enterprise, social impact. And we uh, met some angel investors. We did a deal room, as they called it, and um, received our first round of angel funding, which really, Kickstarter was important, but really it was that angel, angel funding that helped us um, import the machinery we needed to start roasting and packaging and get Vega off the ground. Um, and then from there, yeah, it was a lot of um, blood, sweat, and tears around the funding round. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how would you characterize Vega's current sort of state as a business, number of customers, financial stability, all that good stuff? Yeah, we are, so we've now, so we started initially in Nicaragua operationally, we've now expanded also to Colombia. Um, and we started initially with this idea of being strictly D to C, so direct to consumer, kind of like the Warby Parker, Bark Box, fill in the blank of coffee. Um, you order online, you get a subscription, it delivers to your house regularly. And actually, over the years, what we um, we still have that is kind of our core but we've expanded significantly actually in other ways, um, namely colleges and universities, also um, uh, like premium mission aligned food companies that need coffee as an ingredient, preparing a cold brew or something like that. Um, and then yeah, enterprise level clients, clients like offices, like an Airbnb or Headspace headquarters, something like that. So, um, so yeah, so we've grown significantly significantly from those initial customers, which really actually came from our Kickstarter. We yeah. gave different levels of our subscription. Yeah. So it started out this like motley crew of like, we're gonna change coffee. And now um, we're getting a little bit more on the radar. <laughs> <laughs> and it's vegacoffee.com. Yeah, V-E-G-A coffee. Vegacoffee.com, <laughs> you guys, check it out. You too can get high quality yeah. coffee delivered directly to your home. So Lawam, I'm gonna move to you because actually both of our um, asset owners speakers are investors in Vega Coffee, interestingly. Um, so Luam, this is an investment that you made. I would love if you would give a couple of highlights from your portfolio, maybe for the brand community here, a little bit more on the environmental sustainability side. Can you highlight a couple of interesting investments and tell them your thoughts around them, why you invested in them, and how they're doing, how you're thinking about their impact, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's multiple ways to think about impact, and I think a lot of impact investors kind of fall into this. 
Um, one of the ways that we think about it is, as I'm sure a lot of others do, is the environmental impact. So companies that have solutions that are built to service the environment. Um, one of our investments is this company called Vartega that's based in Colorado that recycles carbon fiber, um, which is a really, really expensive component material for a lot of um, aerospace, automotive companies. So that is interesting to us because there's an element of reuse in the environment. There's an element of resource efficiency, landfill management, whatever, whatever you really want to call it in terms of um, reuse of a product. Uh, so that's great and that's been a space that has been quite interesting to me and I know to a lot of other um, investors that are focused on zero waste as that becomes more and more of a topic of conversation. Um, the implication for companies like that, while extremely interesting, is a much longer life cycle, which is something that everyone has to come to terms with. Um, and I'm particularly speaking to the entrepreneurs in the audience. Uh, plays like that are super interesting and can grow sustainably, but more often than not, the life cycle of that is going to be a little bit longer as you figure out who your customers are, um, how effective your uh, product is, and you make multiple iterations to it. So worthwhile cause, definitely, and when it works, it works. Um, so that's great, but just a piece of advice, those uh, kinds of companies tend to have a much longer uh, life cycle. And then the other way that we think about it is who, either who you're investing in or what that investment is doing. So is it servicing low-income populations? For instance, giving uh, access to financial services that are affordable to low-income populations, or is it servicing low-income patients? Um, and then, obviously, investing in female founders that are doing something sustainable or um, founders of color that are doing something sustainable. So it brings up the question, I don't know if anybody out there is thinking, do I have to give up my financial returns in order to do impact investing? Was anybody thinking that? Because that's a super, super common question. Okay. So, um, and, I, and I think, and I'm going to ask, I'm going I'm to punt this to you in a minute. Um, and I think the answer to that question, like, do you have to give up financial returns? I think the answer is sometimes. Like, sometimes, depending on what you're doing. And the impact investing spectrum, the way that I think of it, at least, encompasses everything. It encompasses cash. And we have Kat Taylor, actually, who is going to talk about um, the bank that she is the CEO of, which would be a wonderful alternative to your mainstream bank. You could actually think of yourself as an imp impact investor simply by moving your cash holdings from a big bank that doesn't do very well for its people to one that does, that invests in its community, um, to the early stage sort of startup investments, which frankly in any world is high risk and very, very difficult to be successful at. And so it depends on how you're thinking about your investments. It depends on which part of the investment spectrum that you're on. And I'm punting this to you, Nancy, because you guys have a total portfolio. You look at everything. You've got public equities. You've got fixed income. You use different parts of your portfolio as well as philanthropic capital. So um, tell us a little bit about how, uh, so I don't think everybody is a, an early stage investor. So I'd love you to think about like just the other impactful parts of your portfolio, if you could talk about that, and then how you guys think about the financial returns. I know it's a spend down foundation, but right. um, you, you need returns to keep generating your right. high impact investments. So what are your thoughts? That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> so I'd say overall, so the foundation, I work directly for the founder. You know, they've screened since its beginnings with the environmental social governance screen across their assets. And I don't have privy to all that. My, um, my primary focus has been on the impact side, both the philanthropic capital, which we use for early stage enterprises, and then donations to outstanding organizations here in Santa Barbara County, and kind of collaboratively in the US with other funders and co-investors. So we think I've been primarily focused on philanthropic funding that is catalytic, which means it's gonna have an impact, it's gonna develop and help scale a, a business model that is sustainable, which means it doesn't have to be profitable. It can be covering its costs in Haiti, in rural parts of Guatemala. We don't have the expectation that you're gonna have a profitable company or organization that's gonna be able to provide services, financial health, and other services at a, a, with a high margin. It just doesn't, we don't believe in that. We believe in using capital for good and capital for impact. Um, so that's, you know, we focus on that kind of, from a grant side, from a debt side, we do lending. We work with a partner that is another impact investor that helps us structure those loans because we don't have the expertise in-house. 
that is concessionary. In other words, it's returning the principal, and it ha may have between one and five percent percentage points, depending on the market that it's in, in Mexico or or uh, wh wh whatever country. And then we recycle that and use it for another loan. So it's, I've really been focused. And then we do funds, as I mentioned, that are um, fixed income. Really, these organizations we're providing a half a million or a million. We ex expect that capital back plus a small percentage. But it is, and then th those funds are being lent to social enterprises in the developing world that are working to get basic products and services to people with dignity that are living in poverty. So, that, I mean, that's kind of the focus. Um, as I shared with Julia earlier, since we're spending down, the founders saying kind of year over year, take another X, find other funds that are impact oriented that are primarily fixed income. We're looking at some equity opportunities and new contraception technology here in the US as an example. Um, but they want to use it in their lifetime. So, um, and, then they're, and then now we're asking our asset manager to actually screen using some of the gender lens tools that are available for public equities and, and funds and so forth so that we can do kind of a deeper dive on the existing kind of assets within the foundations. It's not a, we don't really have a corpus. We're, I, don't, I wouldn't bore you with all the details. It doesn't operate like normal, There's, it's, it's carved out and the piece that is under the Link Foundation umbrella is being screened and used for impact depending on kind of what asset class that we're looking at. But I've been primarily focused on thankfully on, on the impact side where we can really think about impact first, maybe some, re, some return of principle, you know, return of principle plus interest, and then repurposing that again toward something else that we think might even have higher impact, and especially screening now with gender in mind, and you know, there's another conversation to have, but so that's been exciting. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of conversations to have. I mean, we don't have a ton of time, and so I just want to be mindful. Um, if you guys have questions, start throwing them out here. And if you don't, I have a million more. Who, who, who's brave? Who wants to start our, who wants to start our first question of the day? Yes, sir. Yeah, the foundation will close its doors. What's remaining, in the case of this foundation, will get allocated toward. X nonprofits, whatever's remaining, because technically we won't be able to spend it down, but we're trying to use as much capital as we can every year. It's hard to find in the early stage social enterprise at the size of the organization that we are to find these direct investments. So if we don't use it in the year, we're, we're trying to put it now toward funds and other things that have impact if we can't get it out into to an actual direct investment. But yeah, we'll actually physically close our doors. The foundation will no longer exist, and whatever assets are remaining will be directed by. Which I would argue yeah. is a better strategy for a foundation. It's a little controversial, but historically foundations have been set up for generations. You've heard of them, they've been around forever, and they'll keep the corpus, and then they, they grant out 5% per annum because of tax codes. But I think there's a movement these days that the problems are urgent, the environmental issues are urgent, the social justice issues are urgent, and so keeping a foundation forevermore and just spending a tiny percentage of it is, has become less popular, less acceptable. And so there's more and more pressure these days. And I think this isn't, you guys weren't responding to pressure. This is just what the founder's view is since, of the world. Yeah, the, since the, the beginning. Founders, like, use it my lifetime. Yes. Let's get it to work yeah. toward the problems that we care right. about. And so, so for yeah. the founders, have more direct connection than to the work that they're doing. And so I think there's, there's a much more of a, a move towards spending down. What else? Anything else? It's so hard to see with that big light up there. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was kind of talking can you, about. Can you semi repeat the question? I'm not sure if they can pick up on the questions on video. Yeah, she was. Uh, she asked about the life cycle about a zero waste model. Um, the point I'm trying to make there is it's a long business cycle, for sure. So the first thing you would have to do is work on actually getting a product that is high quality and can be used. And then finding a source that's big enough, right? Especially as you start to grow, sourcing will become more and more of an issue. But getting to the proof points and then getting to the point where you found the industries that you want to target um, is difficult because, and not to say, not to deter you, 
but something to just keep in mind. You will have to hit a bunch of proof points along the way, especially if it's a high value industry like automotive or something, um, because they'll have a lot of requirements that you'll have to hit before they could partner with you as an organization. Um, so I think that that industry in and of itself is super interesting and a lot of people are moving towards thinking more about that sort of business model, but it does have a longer lead time. So things to kind of keep in mind, especially when you're fundraising or thinking through that sort of strategy, like it's going to be a longer amount of time and you want to get as much traction, milestones as possible before your next round of fundraising so you can raise at a higher valuation. Speaking of fundraising, Nushin, <laughs> um, for those of you out there who have ventures or are thinking about starting ventures, one of your biggest challenges is gonna be fundraising. Um, would love to hear your experience. You talked a tiny bit about your initial Friends and Family Angel and that first deal room, and now you have you know, two star mm -hmm. investors in your yep. fund. <laughs> Is there, can you talk a little bit about that path? I mean, we were talking today earlier, a lot of early ventures go to business plan competitions, which there are a lot of. Um, y you know, what's, what are your suggestions? What are your thoughts about the fundraising path? And it's never ending, I believe. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> is, it, yeah, it does not end. Um, and it is, in some ways, I mean, it's important to sort of vet opportunities if you can with folks that have gone through them, like any sort of accelerator program or, or um, business venture competitions. That's all great. Um, at the same time, there are so many times that you sort of look at attending something and you're sort of like, I'm not really sure if this is worth the time or not. And we've got all this, you know, we're juggling a thousand things. Can we make this happen? And then lo and behold, that ends up being an opportunity where you've made some really important connection with, let's say it's a funding source or even just beyond um, investment, but like partnerships that um, are, are wind up being very crucial to the path of your business. So um, for me, I think it's been a mix of attending, um, you know, like I mentioned SOCAP, but gatherings, um, gatherings like that, conferences like that, where they're bringing together um, other ventures, other funders, you know, just that whole ecosystem around social impact investing. So I think looking for those opportunities. Also, um, you know, every social impact company kind of has the other realms that they're a part of. Like we're a, a coffee company, we're, you know, kind of a food company as well. And so we've also explored those areas. So we try to kind of think open, openly around um, our industries and our networks. And so really, you know, getting in there and meeting folks, kind of some of it sort of like that, the old fashioned way of like who you meet um, can really make a difference in where things go. Um, did you attend any of those incubators, accelerators? We did. So we, before, when we first left, um, when we first moved to Nicaragua and first started Vega, we had been accepted into the Agora Partnerships oh. Accelerator Program. Mm -hmm. So, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, that's a program for Latin American um, social enterprise businesses just throughout the Central and South America. Um, and that was, you know, that was pivotal for us. And oh. I gotta say, like each one of these programs, um, have kind of led to other um, contacts, other opportunities, mm -hmm. like Village Capital mm -hmm. was has been absolutely fundamental in um, other, uh, other investors, actually. Some that have come on board based on the fact that we were, that Village Capital was an investor, some that mm. Village Capital directly connected us to. Oh, interesting. So, and same with like, Nancy has been an incredible advocate for us. I mean, just, um, just unbelievable in terms of, really, really being generous about connecting us with possible partners and funders and all of that. And we've seen some incredible yeah. results there. So yeah. I think um, I think it's a, you know, we've been fortunate by having some really incredible funders. And then there's others that, you know, we also kind of prod to like, hey, could you introduce us to this person? They might be interested to know what we're doing, you know? So um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a lot of persistence. It's, yeah. it, and it's the eternal kind of challenge as an entrepreneur. You're trying to run your business and then you're trying to yeah. meet the investors, get them what they need yeah. and you know, all of that. So it's a, um, lot. It's a lot, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I will say um, one of the pieces of advice that I would offer to the entrepreneurs and the students in the room is um, I think networking has kind of a negative connotation to it. And I, I think that's unfortunate because uh, you know I've been 30 years in the business and I have to say, 
um, at every opportunity when somebody asks me if I could help them anything, help with their resume, help them introduce them to somebody, I have always said yes whenever I could because it then builds your goodwill in the industry. So when you need a favor or when somebody that you're very close to needs an introduction, you, you can call upon that. And so a lot of it is really reaching out and helping whenever you can and not being the person who only shows up and calls when you need something from them. So I would highly recommend just like continue to invest in your network of people because they will be very, very helpful for you, for you as you build your career. And Julie, can I just add to that yes. too that you know, as a, as a funder and investor, there's other roles that you can play alongside of your capital. So it's, you know, I find in Latin America, I have to be in the country to find the entrepreneurs generally. I mean, they're down there doing the work. I mean, so, and part of it's lifting them up. Like with Nushin, we've had the, you know, opportunity to underwrite to have her go to London so that she could be part of a gender investing summit and Women Deliver coming up where, because we want this company to be recognized. That's where the investors in the community is. So there's roles that you can play Along with technical assistance, which you know, it's, it, Village Capital's done several studies. It's so critical to accompany these companies and, and, and entrepreneurs along the path. Right. And technical assistance is key to success. We see this; it's it's hard work. The challenges are immense, and so whether it's via these um, accelerators or networks, whether it's you as an with your own foundation or as an individual investor, I think it's just a really important role yeah. to really ask. How, do, how can we really partner with you uh, along this? And I think that, A, and that's what makes the work so rich and rewarding, mm -hmm. so. It's true, when I first came into the impact investing field, I had spent, um, I don't know, 20 years as a traditional investment manager, and I was amazed in the impact investing field, just how collaborative and how, mm -hmm how gracious people were, really generous. It's a, it's a really lovely field from that standpoint. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Interesting. Do you want to start and can you semi-repeat the question? Um, I think she's asking about a governance structure. Do you mean like in terms of a team or do you mean in terms of an incorporation? What do you mean? Do you mean like legal structure, yeah. S Corp LLC? Um, yes, that's good to define it. I was really thinking about board of directors or kind of committees oh. that have the kind of reporting that they do. Oh. Excellent, great yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Um, don't know if the recording heard it, but she's talking about just team structure um, and board of directors, advisors, and any sort of reporting requirements, is that right? Okay, yeah, so I think that um, it's always great in the beginning for uh, companies that are especially social enterprises to have a great group of board of advisors, and if you could get any advisors that were in the industry that you're trying to disrupt, have some sort of knowledge because your advisors, especially in the early days, will be like your source of like contact to other different people, potentially investors, potentially clients. Um, so who you want advising you in the early days is super, super important, as I'm sure uh, Nushin will, will mention. But uh, the other component is a lot of impact investors. And as impact investing becomes a little bit more common, there's a lot of emphasis on metrics and what sort of metrics we can measure. How can we quantify the impact that your social enterprise is, is actually creating? So not only that, not only more of a st storytelling situation where you say that this is what our company does and this is how it helps, but how much, who is it helping, and by how much, um, which is super interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, um, please join me in thanking our speakers today, Nancy Luan Thank you so much. I think I'm handing it to you, right? Um, thank you guys so much. I'm going to introduce Steve Gaines, who I believe needs no introduction here, who is the Dean of the Brent School. Thank you so much right. for having us here. Thank you, Julia. And panel, that was a terrific discussion and uh, a great way to launch this discussion about uh, women and innovation and entrepreneurship. And so I get to have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Kat Taylor. And I can't think of a better person to kind of fin take us home on this particular topic and, and really help us think through the uh, uh, potential roles of women in impact investing and entrepreneurship and innovation more broadly. Kat wears a number of hats. She was the co-founder and 
Managing Partner for Radical Impact, so not just high impact, but radical <laughs> impact, which uh, invests in people in early stage uh, companies uh, in a variety of topic areas, but mostly in the healthy food systems, clean energy, and in responsible finance. In, in that particular space, she's also the CEO of Beneficial State Bank, which I think she's gonna talk to us about in terms of its uh, interesting business model uh, from the standpoint of uh, responsible finance. Um, she's also um, the, one of the co-founders of one of the foundations that I think has the catchiest title, the Tomcat Foundation, um, um, which uh, w has uh, uh, invested in a whole variety of different both educational and environmental spaces, including funding uh, a big project here at UC in the UC's Carbon Neutrality Project, which is really a, an effort to try to take the University of California to carbon neutrality by 2025, and so it played a really big, important role in that. So please welcome Kat Taylor. Thank you so much. Am I coming through? Have I put my thing on right? It's okay? Okay. Uh, what an honor to be here uh, at this wonderful school and meeting all the entrepreneurs and the other investors who've come here from the impact space. So I apologize, I'm going to speak somewhat quickly because I want to get through the bank model as the first real impact investment that my husband Tom Steyer and I made in 2007 uh, and to suggest that we've actually migrated away from being business people and philanthropists to impact investors and political activists. Not that we don't still do some philanthropy, but it's a fraction of the time that we and resource and energy that we spend. Um, and I'm gonna start with a song to, to, to mention part of the problem that we're trying to address. Guess ours is not the first bank heartbroken. Our eyes are not the first to be deceived. We are not the first to know the bust of CDOs and thieves. You know we're just some fools who are willing to try it one more time with zeal. But baby, can't you see? There's only sex tawdry appeal, yet we're hopelessly devoted to dough. But now there's no way to hide since we saw beneath high tide our hats in our hands how could we not then understand that we built an economy sugar-coated for ceos who serve hopelessly devoted to dough the treasury says fools forget it the gses are hunkering low how loose can we get before we simply let the biggest banks be hopelessly devoted to dough. But now there's no way to stand with the wage law of the land bids me against you. Pay not to live only to work for some jerks who are hopelessly devoted to dough. But I'll be hopelessly devoted to you. So. <laughs> That, to quote Hunter, uh, uh, Hunter Levins, that is how you distinguish your brand. So <laughs> <laughs> I am not a usual CEO of the banks, but we recognized when, when we started out on this uh, that pe being people in finance, that there was something terribly wrong in the banking system. And we do work at the systems level, because if we don't get the systems right, these large interlocking interdependent systems with cycles and dynamics, we're not going to win the whole human race. Um, so the problems in banking, uh, as we go through this, um, are important because banking drives huge societal outcomes, not just business outcomes. And I want to posit that's true of all business and the whole economy. So we can work really hard in philanthropy and really hard in government, and I'm a staunch supporter of government as the only truly accountable mechanism we have to self-organize. But if we don't get business right, we can't compensate. 
So in spite of regulatory efforts that we all watched in, uh, at the beginning of the Great Recession, the banking system has not been serving our, the public interest and is still not serving the public interest. And I'm going to dwell mostly in the land of solutions, but we have to go through the train of misery. It's not what the banks tell you that they are doing, it's what they don't tell you they're doing, and that's the train of misery they drag behind them. These statistics are a little old. It's almost $400 billion that's been paid by the banks for abusing consumers, mostly in credit cards, just a cost of doing business. They're very, very profitable. They don't even notice they could lose that in a day, and it wouldn't matter. In fact, uh, B of A had a uh, four billion dollar capital account error write their balance sheet for a year and nobody noticed, not the inside or the outside auditors, because it doesn't actually really matter, even though it canceled their dividend. Almost five million people lost their homes in the foreclosure crisis, mostly in communities of color. One third of bank tellers are on some form of public assistance, even though these are the most profitable companies in the world. That's a shocking transfer of a private cost to a public resource. And they're still financing coal. J notwithstanding Jamie Dimon coming up and saying, what's all this I hear about climate change? His bank, Chase, JP Morgan Chase, led the pack in the highest funding of uh, fossil fuels in 2018 in hundreds of billions of dollars. So if you want to know who's killing your future, look, you don't have to look much further than the banks. But there's a positive moral to the story, is, which is that we can fix the banking system together. And we can only do it together. Um, we can take back our power of choice. We have both choice, which is agency, and we have accountability, which is responsibility. So where your money sleeps at night matters and should matter to you because it's getting stuff done and you want to be sure it's stuff that you want. We can change the banking system for good, and that's the mission of the bank. Nothing less. It's not good enough to be a good bank in a bad system. So why is so bank banking so powerful? We think of it as the first and most powerful form of crowdfunding, much like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, et cetera, because we pool our idle cash, call them deposits, in the banking system, then we enable the banking system with massive prerogatives that are publicly granted, ostensibly to finance the world we want to live in, but it hasn't been that to date. Uh, it's not that a specific deposit funds a specific loan, by the way, but all deposits fund a lending practice, and that lending practice is super powerful. So uh, it's powerful because it recycles. When you make a loan out of a bank, it comes back and you make it again. Our impact accumulates over time to the extent that, for instance, in a three-year period when the city of San Francisco built a net 100 per year affordable house housing units, we built 4,600 over the three-year period. Um, it also has FDIC insurance. That's uh, the ability of the banks to self-insure with uh, the U.S. taxpayer standing behind that system if it fails, and it did. In the recession, it failed, and we bailed out not only banks, but insurance companies and auto lenders who, who stood in counterparty relationship to the banks. Um, that FDIC insurance allows us to collect deposits risk-free up to $250,000, which means we get those deposits easily and cheap cheapest source of funding in the economy outside of securitization. Uh, we also get to use leverage. So for every $1 of equity we've invested in the bank, we can combine that with $9 of deposits and make a $10 loan. That's 10 times leverage. It's more complicated than that because of the fractional reserve system, but you can think of it that way. And our leverage ratio at 10 to 1 is the most conservative in the industry. When Bear Stearns uh, went bust, they were levered 33 to 1. Um, Discipline. We have 25 exams a year, inside and outside regulators. We can tell you exactly what we're doing, and so can the big banks. They just choose not to. Um, they also have scale. They're just massive. They, uh, the banking industry is now bigger than any other industry, including oil and gas, and that doesn't even take into consideration that what's called the shadow banking industry, which is capital flows outside of regulated entities. And then the interdependencies, you know this from a system standpoint, everything is connected to everything else uh, and banking fuels it all. So here's a sign of how big the financial giants are. Those are, um, those are numbers ending in a T and that's a problem. Also, this is outside of the organized banking system. We have a growing shadow banking system um, and they are super influential because they throw money around incredibly more than any other industry. So this, these are lobbying dollars by industry with finance at the top. 
uh, and campaign contributions also, the growth has been obscene of that. So if you wonder where we're getting government, it's actually coming from, in part from the banking industry. Um, our bank was designed to be a counterpoint to everything the banking uh, system is doing in, uh, incorrectly in our view. And the first, uh, uh, so there are six areas of activity that we think you have to get right in the banking system because it's quasi-public, it belongs to us, and it needs to behave according to the public interest. So the first, and I'm glad somebody brought up owner, uh, governance, um, we have to align the ownership and therefore the governance for a multi-stakeholder model. It is not correct that the only duty of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value. That has been debunked, unfortunately, it's still being taught. It was never right, it isn't right now. Our, our multiple stakeholders include, of course, our equity shareholder, but also our customers, our colleagues, the communities in which we work, the planet upon which we all depend, and the public interest at large. And the way we assured that was he gave, we gave 100% of the economic rights to a public charity foundation. So it's like we're a for-profit bank that's owned by a nonprofit, and that nonprofit is permanently governed in the public interest. It means at the end of the day, if we distribute profit, it only goes to a nonprofit entity whose bylaws mandate that they reinvest those profits into the communities that we serve that are all low income uh, and the environment upon which we depend. Second area of, of essential alignment is the lending practice, which I just said to you is the most powerful thing that a bank does. In our case, we insist that 75% is in the new economy that's fully inclusive, racially and gender just, environmentally restorative, and the other 25% can't be doing something bad. And we're very rigorous about how we measure this. We measure the output, where do the loan dollars land, and the outcome, what do they do once they get here? There, this is our commercial lending practice, uh, which is in things like renewable energy, low income housing, sustainable food. Um, and then we also make uh, consumer loans, mostly auto loans, and that's where most of the abuse in the banking system has been on the product side, so we have to get that straight. So uh, governance, lending, the products. They have to have mission at the heart of them. You should be healthier the day after you take a banking product than the day before. One example is overdrafts. We process uh, checks from the smallest to the largest. The big banks, all the other banks pretty much go largest to smallest to maximize the number of overdrafts in a day. And then they charge a huge amount and they don't limit how many they charge in a day. That's not mission driven. Um, then the fourth area is we need to be radically transparent. We are a quasi-public institution. If you want to know what we're doing, you should get to know everything about us and you shouldn't have to ask. It should be third party audited, data driven, and published. Uh, the fifth area is, um, or excuse me, this is an extension of our radical transparency about our corporate practices. So for instance, we follow a beneficial employment. We pay 150% of living wage uh, in all markets fully benefited. That's what's estimated to cost a, one adult and a dependent to live. We're not paying people to work, we're paying them to live. Uh, we also submit ourselves to a massive number of um, assessments by third parties. Uh, probably one of the most important is the B Corporation. Um, there are now about 4,600 B Corporations. Somebody asked at lunch, is there a positive trend in corporate uh, responsibility? Well, B Corporations are an example of that. We have a long way to go, but I think people are going to wise up to the fact that business should serve us. Um, we're also, you don't get diversity unless you choose it, so this is a strong mandate in our organization. This is about our all staff statistics, but the same it, it, we, it would be reflected on our board uh, and uh, senior management in particular. Um, we can't do this alone, so we join Allies for Strength, and that's an extension of our diversity. We have to be in coalition with other organizations run by more different and younger people. Um, and we're advocates. So the, the uh, fifth area of concern is how the banks advocate and who they advocate for. The, other, the big banks in the system never advocate for the public. They are always anti-consumer. They are always anti-government regulation. They are always anti-government in general. Um, we will not advocate for anything that isn't pro-consumer, pro-environment, pro-social justice. And we do this in uh, alliance with other organizations that are similarly value-driven. Um, 
the, uh, so those are the areas of banking that we have to get right. But it's not OK, as I said, to be a good bank in a bad system. So we have to have a theory of change, how we're actually going to change the banking system. We are pulling all the levers we can. We are uh, joining consumer movements so that consumers will t take up their agency and accountability over banking. We are working with regulatory regimes to incorporate non-financial performance metrics that must be met by regulatory mandate. Uh, and we were working in the policy arena. So we're big supporters of public banks, if you've heard of those. Uh, we are uh, in the lead of standing up a, a consumer protection regulatory agency at the state level and inspiring that in other states. Uh, and we are also feverishly trying to transform the rules around private charity, which came up before, because we do not need dynastic fortunes. We need immediate solutions. Um, we don't need to see that. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> um, this is just, I'm sorry to say, uh, this is a reiteration of just, they're not lending into the right places yet. They are mostly holding trading assets that are speculative, and they shouldn't do that with depositors' money, uh, the biggest banks, and they are not lending into Main Street economy. Uh, we have a proposal with the Volcker Alliance to develop a plan to rescind FDIC insurance from the money center banks because they're not behaving in a way to deserve it. And if they couldn't collect deposits, it would return $13 trillion of deposits in the American economy alone to Main Street banking. And it would also force them to compete against hedge funds on an even footing, because that's what they are. Um, so I have to cover that. Sorry. Oh, hello. Here we go. Uh, I just, I'm speed throwing it because I want to get to. Oh, uh, you will hear a lot of hubbub about Dodd-Frank and how it's over-regulation and inefficient. It may not be the perfect way to regulate banks, but it's the only thing we've got protecting us right now. Um, we work on a number of other things uh, to try to protect and restore banking. And we also stood up a venture fund alongside it. So Radical Impact Partners is an early stage transformative impact venture fund. It has a majority of women in the leadership positions. We, find, we fund in good food, good money, good energy, essentially. And we will not fund companies that aren't uh, exerting a transformative impact on the system of those three sectors. Um, we're incredibly lucky in the company we keep. We have 22 portfolio companies. Uh, the origin of the name is that uh, the radical is the seed of the seed. And that's what we're attempting to invest in. Uh, we would like over time, our theory of change is if we do a good job, we will migrate a billion dollars of investment capital to transformative social, pro-social and pro-environmental companies. Uh, we care a lot about diversity in the companies. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of this, but it's sort of, you've heard a lot from the experts that were just on the panel about impact investing and the importance of measuring, um, uh, we, this is um, the cross-cutting uh, dynamics that we insist on in all companies, that there's diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's empowerment and resilience, uh, on, in addition to transformative impact in the three sectors. Uh, and we get deadly serious about impact measurement because in order to migrate a billion dollars of, of capital, we have to be very real about what we're actually accomplishing. Uh, <coughs> The, this is a reflection of the diversity that we seek and insist upon in the founders and the management of the companies. I think that's, um, and this is all so that we can build something beautiful together. I uh, was just um, allowed to interview Anand who, uh, Gerard Das, who wrote Winners Take All. And it's a rather scathing indictment of philanthropy. I think it goes overboard, to be honest, but I think if we don't harness the power of business and restore the viability of, of government, uh, then the philanthropy isn't really going to help us at all. Um, and uh, we really do need to make sure that philanthropy is not um, basically involved in maintaining the status quo, but is rather getting us rapidly on to the next regime uh, that will sustain the human species. The earth is going to spit us out like a watermelon seed if we don't do that and go on just fine without us. 
uh, but I prefer uh, to stay on the playing field and get something done. Last thing I wanted to mention is that um, in the midst of so many natural monopolies, which is essentially, in my view, what Netflix, Google, YouTube, Facebook, uh, banking, agriculture are, that we could devise something called a platform cooperative that would allow every person to own a little bit of everything and nobody to own too much of anything. So I'm happy with that to take any questions and thank you for your patience while I spit speed red. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> Emily asked me to moderate questions. Good. <laughs> Please, sir, tell us. Um, great presentation and you and Tom are doing great things. Actually, you know what? Let me hand you the okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, uh, our friend Yvonne Chenard has been here with some of his key people and he's preached to Bren and elsewhere on campus uh, using the B Corporation as a model. Now, you referenced that very quickly in passing, but it sounds like you have a slightly different structure. So I was going to ask, can you explain a little bit about the uh, benefits and disadvantages of what you're doing versus uh, sure. a B Corporation? Yeah. I made a huge mistake in the beginning. Because we're owned by a nonprofit and we've declared and serve a multiple stakeholder model, I thought the only thing we're worried about is, is no longer a problem, uh, which is basically a shareholder suit for failure to maximize profit. And so I took a big pass on B Corporation for three years. And then much wiser students came from Presidio School of Management and said, why don't you let us take us through as our capstone project the GEARS assessment and the B Corp assessment. So we did that. We scored really high. We joined the community. And then I was like, oh my goodness, this was not about a shareholder defense. This was about the, com the company you keep. And it is a remarkable body of companies, some as big as Patagonia, Seventh Generation, King Arthur Flower. You know, there's some really big com uh, method, uh, big uh, companies. And some companies that have been bought by multinationals and allowed to keep their B Corp status. So we feel very enthusiastic about the B Corporation movement. I, I am on record of saying that I think we have to move beyond where B Lab assessment is right now, which is you can only earn positive points. You cannot draw negative points. But we need to start rating companies in general in the economy and about nine-tenths of them need negative points of some sort or another. So I'm, we're just working within the organization to try to see if they would do that. But I, I agree with Yvonne. It, business has got to start being a force for good and it has to stop doing the harm. When Larry, Larry Fink famously said that they were going to make all their portfolio companies at BlackRock do one good thing, we wrote an op-ed, The Mouse That Roared. I think 12 people read it. But <laughs> that said, keep your stink in one thing and stop them from doing all the bad things. Can you also, on that um, topic, talk about your, I think you guys were founders in the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. Yes, Can my you? favorite trade association, Wonderful. although I love the CDBDA too. Yeah. So the Global Alliance for Banking on Values uh, grew up out of, as the brainchild of Peter Blom at Triodos Bank in the Netherlands. He got some other bank CEOs of long-standing banks throughout the world, world together that are um, do commit to uh, doing all of their business based on a value system that's well articulated, measured. Um, so these are, they could all be B Corporation banks. They are in far flung countries that may not yet be on to that trend. Um, and they include some very big and ancient banks like Credit Cooperative, which is over 100 years old. Bracht Bank, which has a billion and a half customers, GLS Bank in uh, Germany, and Triodos that are both over 20 billion in assets at least. 20 billion euros, I think, in assets. So, but anyway, they're um, wonderful banks. And there again, we convene once a year, and we shore each other up, and we bring more. There's now 46 banks in that system. Um, but we are not attacking the big banks, and I think, uh, as you can see a theme here. Everywhere I go, I'm like, we gotta attack the big banks. I actually think I'm 60, year old, 60 years old. It is my job to knock the obstacles out of the way so that you all, younger people, can build beautiful companies that don't have this um, force for evil in the way. So uh, that's what we're maybe gonna do with a couple of new board members is get GABV to go after the big ones. And then you're gonna get your Avengers outfit out? <laughs> and start fighting for good. 
What other questions here in the audience? Um, I was actually, if nobody jumps in, um, I was actually wondering, so we, we went really quickly through Radical Impact's portfolio here, Kat. We do have a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience. Yeah. Are, there, are there any sort of favorite investments that you want to highlight in your yeah. good food, good money, good? Yeah, yeah. I'll rattle yeah. through some uh, famous and not famous. So we are investors in Just, what, what used to be called Hampton Creek, Hampton Creek Foods, but now it's called Just, which is busily making the uh, intellectual property to do not a plant-based proteins started with eggs. Now they're going into meat too. Um, Ohm Connect, which is helping uh, ordinary citizens manage their demand response to uh, increase their I monthly income and contribute to a net zero energy economy. Um, the uh, Lend Up, which is uh, an alternative to predatory consumer lending. Um, Carbon Lighthouse, tackling this, the energy retrofit and efficiency space for smaller buildings, which is an inefficient rain area for the bigger companies to get into. Um, uh, um, oh, what am I forgetting? All of them, some of them. Um, Ripple, Ripple's in your portfolio. Yep, Ripple, so plant-based uh, milks and other dairy products. E-currency, developing a fiat block, uh, blockchain currency for central banks. Uh, GECO, uh, intermediating, getting rid of banks altogether. Wouldn't that be a good idea? <laughs> uh, Ample, a battery swapping platform for energy storage uh, in the vehicular space. Um, that's uh, good. There's 22 in all, yeah. but um, it's been super interesting. You've got a great team working on that mm -hmm. portfolio. What else? Questions for, yes, hello. Yes. Tell us. Oh, wait. <laughs> so, Kat, you're so um, mission and value driven along with Tom. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and what influenced you and has mm -hmm. led you to this point? You're sure. an inspiration. Yeah. Somebody came up to me the other night and said, what happened to you when you were a little? <laughs> uh, my first memories in my life were watching what I think of as the civil rights funerals. So television was new. If you watch television, you watch it with a lot of people. People, your neighbors came into your house to watch television. And I was born in 1958, so uh, you know I was four or five when JFK was shot, then Bobby Kennedy, then Martin Luther King, then Malcolm X. And I just had this burning desire to be part of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. from a really early age. But it wasn't obvious how a white girl from San Mateo, California was going to get involved in the civil rights movement until when I was in college, the great socially responsible banks of the world started getting visibility, like South Shore Bank in Chicago, Carver Bank in Harlem, um, Self-Help Credit Union in North Carolina, even some international banks. And I thought, oh, that's what I could do, because Martin Luther King, in his last speech, said, if we don't capture the power of our spending, the civil and legal rights so hard fought will be lost. And I believe that's true. I think right now we have an extreme inequity problem in the economy. That's the problem. We are underpaying people. I don't care about the unemployment statistic anymore because one in three Americans works full time and meets the federal definition of poverty and it's very racially based. So. Um, that's what I was waiting for my whole life, to get involved in something in the civil rights, and it turned out banking was it. I also come from a banking family, which is a little weird, but it, that was <laughs> karmic. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and to my, I'm married to Tom Steyer, who's Need to Impeach and Next Gen America and Next Gen Climate and everything. And he was you know, raised to be a public servant, and it just turns out that he has to be an activist, not a and not a, an elected at this point, so. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? I'm gonna, yes yeah, sir, I don't have your, I'm not gonna pass this up for so we'll just, re we'll repeat your question. Oh, he has a projection oh. voice. So now you, you've talked about this world where students could be, participate either at, on the investing side or the entrepreneur side. What are things that, and here we have a lot of students in the audience, what, what should they be focusing on learning Such a good question. Do you want to start? Well, I, you know, Manuel Pastor at UCLA uh, calls out the 10 essential components of mass movements, 
And one of them is a plan for the economy. I don't think we, any of us are well educated about the economy and the results and influence that it has. So even if you end up in genomics or clean energy or somewhere else, a, un, a basic understanding of the American economy, I think, helps everybody. And if you're going to go get trained up somewhere, which a lot of people, I mean, where are you going to get trained? At the bigger institutions that are well captive of this economy? Just keep a jaundiced eye. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I, I teach at um, UC Berkeley Haas in the business school. I teach an entrepreneurship class there. And um, I was talking to Dan Pullman actually earlier about this who runs an investment fund in sustainable food and agriculture. And we were saying actually that we're huge supporters of this eco-entrepreneurship program here because the skills that you learn to develop as an entrepreneur, the way of thinking, being really nimble, being lean about your thinking can be used even if you don't become an entrepreneur. That is to say, if you join the largest corporation in the world, you still need innovation, you still need radical thinking, you still need to sort of break down the barriers. And so having that kind of training, I think, is really powerful. And I, I love that you guys have that program here. I also think you should be kind and compassionate and <laughs> <laughs> you know, thoughtful and you should think about others. We don't need to teach our students. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. That's oh, probably nice. true. What I also find, I actually, what I also find at the UCs um, is there's a lot of collaboration. I, I find students super collaborative and really um, collegial, which I love at the UCs. Um, I think we have a little bit of time. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. So there's no substitute for voting and getting out the vote. I'm sorry, it's old fashioned, but we just gotta do it. And uh, I think people will have more of a reason to vote if they can see an economic plan that eliminates desperation. So universal single payer healthcare, uh, so many other developed countries have that and people don't spend their time worrying about either getting sick or being sick. Um, but the, uh, that's why I brought up the platform cooperatives because I think the worst advantage, worst adva disadvantage right now in the economy and in the polity too is the wealth disparity. I think uh, for every one dollar of wealth, white Americans have, um, black Americans have eight cents. And if you don't have wealth, you don't have resiliency, you don't have a way to plan for the future, you don't have a way to finance your kids' education. It's just a real showstopper. And as we get to a, a society and an economy more um, driven by AI and machine learning and everything else, we sh everyone should have a little piece of ownership of the economy and then freedom to do what their passion dictates, not being enslaved to low-wage jobs that basically are like being serfs again. Anybody else have thoughts on that question? Do you have, oh, no, you have a different question? Because that was a big question. Yeah. <laughs> That's a crowdsource answer that we need there. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about the bank. It's a really uh, beautiful model you've created with the bank, and I'm wondering what the current scale is and where you see that scale going in the future, and if anyone's trying to replicate what you've done in other places. Yeah. Thank you. I left that slide out. We are now, <laughs> so we're 11 years old, a billion dollars in assets, 17 branch offices, 250 colleagues. A billion dollars seems huge to us, but you, when you see banks that are two and a half trillion dollars, we're like an error term. However, the military experts of the day knew that David would beat Goliath because of facile, agility, innovation, you know, not stuck in old ways. So I don't think the money center banks are well positioned for the future. They're sort of locked in by status quo, but they are susceptible to competitive uh, advance. And I think it's the regional banks that will figure that out. They'll figure out that they need to straighten up and fly right to win millennial markets so they, won't, they, they can steal deposits away from the big banks. You just saw Bank of the West agreed to divest from fossil fuels over a timeline and pay their employees at least $15 an hour. And I, that's not because they're super nice. It's because the millennials won't bank with them and they're a West Coast bank for the most part, even though they're owned by BNP Paribas. So that was interesting that their parent let them do that too. 
And then equity capital, I am a big fan of divest, invest. I don't know why we tolerate, especially our national foundations being conventionally invested. It's a crime against humanity. But it's a tricky thing because it's a little easier to know what to divest out of than to what to invest into. And banks are excellent investments, especially if they're mission aligned. You have so much impact. We just raised our first two and a half million dollars of capital outside the family. And it was because that philanthropist saw with leverage and discipline and low cost funding, 4,600 units of housing versus 300, you know, sort of thing. And then the last thing is human capital. We get remarkably talented young people coming to work with us and they would not consider going to work for another bank unless it were one of the values aligned banks. So I think that the talent drain for the big banks is gonna be huge. I, do, I never vilify the people who work for the big banks. They employ 250,000 people. People have to work somewhere, but we just wanna give them a much better job like the coal miners. Um, okay, I think our last question. Oh, I'm sorry, is there one up there too? Let me take a look at the time. Okay, if it's a quick question, we can do two. Oh, yeah. The, I like the nuns in the boardroom, too. I love that group. <laughs> um, some, it's a good job for somebody. I think there's, you, you know, um, many approaches at once. Is probably, this, is, this is a massive incumbent system to try to flip. I'm hoping that we're in chaos theory land where, where it gets really bad before it gets good because <laughs> the national government is not my favorite right now. But <laughs> the, um, I would be in favor. I, there was a... Um, uh, you, you know what quantitative easing is? That's what the Fed did to, uh, you know, to buy corporate paper to um, buoy the economy up. Um, there's something that the Democracy Collaborative is promoting called quantitative easing for the planet, and it's to buy majority shares of the big energy companies and keep all the reserves in the ground. I love stuff like that. I think we have to do everything at once. That's awesome. Good question. And I think back here, sir. Last question. Sorry. Oh, the recidivism, that's something straight yeah. up your alley, Kat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was on the board of something called Inside Prison Project for a long time and got schooled on over-incarceration in this country. Um, well, first I would say these Democratic candidates have got to have a plank that's called decriminalizing cannabis and any sentencing related to that, and we should let people out of prison early if they're nonviolent offenders in, the, in a business that's now legal and being run by everybody else but them. Um, we're the most incarcerating country in the world, worse than China and Iran, especially California. We went from 40,000 inmates to 240,000 in 20 years. We have draconian sentencing laws and uh, hopefully this governor will overturn some of them or whatever he can do. Um, and it is just a sad warehousing of human talent. I mean, I think actually um, resisting the system and being incarcerated might be a good entrepreneurial flag. <laughs> it's like that person has some energy to spend somewhere else. So it's, I'm so glad you asked the question because I think it's the hidden tragedy of America that we've just done this and it's crippled whole communities and the racial bias in it is just awful. So, yeah, thanks. We'll keep working in that area, too. Thank you so much, Kat. There oh, was one, one uh, more. Oh, one this, more. One I more. didn't want to. I just wanted to know when we're going to get a branch. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, good so, question. So, good question. Good question. Because we're not on the Central Coast, and we're not in deep Southern California, and those are really big markets. So, uh, we're rethinking what a branch is, mind you. So we, I, we're in favor of branches either being multifunctional, like our Fresno branch serves as a polling place and a get out the vote dispatchment center. Oh, and our Santa Rosa branch is a um, alternative convening space for nonprofits. Um, so we gotta think, if, if we're gonna plunk down brick and mortar, it's gotta do more than one thing. And otherwise we'll be, have traveling bankers. I wanna create something like a notary, only higher trust, 
like a trusted banker. I know that's an oxymoron right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> but a mobile banker? A mobile banker who goes to yeah. s visit seniors instead yeah, yeah, of them yeah. driving perilously to the sense. branch. I love know. that. Yeah, thanks. Yay, let's end here on a high note. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. High note, high note. Yay, thank you so much. Did you want to say anything? You want me to do it? Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to these phenomenal speakers for joining us today. There is a reception upstairs on the Decker's deck. I think it's beautiful. I, uh, I think it's beautiful. Follow Emily and Steve. Thank you so much.